You're going to hear a little bit uh, after we eat some food. You're going to hear about what happened to my wife, Shelly, and how we got through it. And a lot of you prayed us through that. In fact, this church carried not only my wife, but our family through a really, really tough time. And there's a song that was boiling up in my head for several months during all of this. And it was after my wife came out on the other side. And now she'll, she will tell you now that she no longer fears death. And I, and I mean that, like literally, no longer f- fears death. And this song is the reason why. I'd listen carefully to the words. If heaven was an hour, it would be twilight. When the fireflies start the dancing on the lawn And supper's on the stove and mama's laughing And everybody's working days done If heaven was a town, it would be this town On a summer day in 1985 And everything I wanted was out there waiting And everyone I loved was still alive Well, don't cry a tear for me now, baby There comes a time we all must say goodbye And if that's what heaven's made of You know I I ain't afraid to die If heaven was a pie It would be cherry So cool and sweet And heavy on your tongue And just one bite Would satisfy your hunger There'd always be enough For everyone If heaven was a train, it'd be a fast one And that would take this weary traveler around a bend Mm. If heaven was a tear, it'd be my last one And you'd be in my arms again So don't cry tear for me now, baby There comes a time we all must say goodbye If that's what heaven's made of You know I, I ain't afraid to die So don't cry tear for me now, baby There comes a time we all must say goodbye that's what heaven's made of You know I I ain't afraid to die If that's what heaven's made of You know I I ain't afraid to die God, you showed my wife, Shelly, a picture of heaven that was so beautiful. She no longer has the fear, the fear of death. Now, Lord, she looks to that coming day as one of joy, that she gets to be with you, gets to be with Jesus. And Lord, I would pray tonight that every single person in this church can get that much closer to you, that they can have that relationship with you, they can have that relationship with Jesus to know that no matter what we are faced with, no matter what fear we may have, 
to know that it is so beautiful. Heaven is such a good place. That cherry pie tastes so good. That we just cannot wait to be with you, to sit at your feet next to your son so that you can tell us stories, you can share knowledge with us, that we can worship, praise, and sing together. Cannot wait to share that time with every single one of my brothers and sisters. And I pray that I will see every single person in this church there someday in the future. Amen. Thank you. Now can we go eat? <laughs> Hello. I'm not sure if we have cherry pie tonight, though, so y'all don't get mad. <laughs> We're going to bless the food, and after we bless the food, uh, get everybody's going to sit down. And like I said, we're trying something new, so we pray everybody's respectful uh, when Tim and Shelly begin to speak. And I'd ask all the smackers sit in the back. Amen. <laughs> Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your grace and mercy. Thank you for Tim and Shelly's life. What an inspiration and a strong witness you have spoken through them. And, uh, Father, we ask that you would bless the food and the drink and the time of fellowship, and that every word would be honoring to you, and we know it will, and that you would just relax them. And, Lord, I pray that Tim and Shelly feel like they're just sitting in their living room telling a story that easy. And may you get all the glory for it. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, y'all feel free to go in the back. You have this, and we were, you know, all of these different things, just tell God, just tell God to take it away. Um, and a lot of people don't know that I, for about the last almost, almost 30 years, 25 years, I've, I've suffered from headaches. I've had MRIs, CAT scans, everything. They're like, there's nothing in there. You're just one of those people that will have headaches and you just have to deal with it. Um, so I took a lot of aspirin daily um, and just dealt with it. And so what I did was when I stepped back without telling him, I was praying to God to take my headaches away. And I said, I know you can do this. And I'm up there almost arguing with him, kind of. But I was adamant that I'm like, I, I stand up here and I'm singing all the time. And I'm telling people what they should be doing when I've never asked you to take my headaches away which is interesting. So I sat back there and I said, I know you can take these headaches away. I, I declare me healed and I will never have a headache again. And I, I believe that you can do that for me. And then sung the rest of the, the you know, set there at, the, at church. And then we just went about our business. We never, we never talked about it. Um, then we were, we're musicians. Um, but before all of this, too, we actually had a gig where we were singing in um, Addison somewhere. Um, we got off at like 11 p.m. that night. And this was the Tuesday right after that Sunday. Right after that, yes, yeah, Tuesday now. And we're laughing, joking, we're singing in the car, having a merry time. I actually did not have a headache at all at that time. Um, and it was very stormy that night. And we have a lot of animals. And so when we got home, he's like, I'm going to check the fences and make sure all the animals are where they're supposed to be. All of you farm people know when there's storms, you've got to check your stuff. And so it's late and he's outside with his flash, with his phone, actually making sure he doesn't walk into a cobweb. And I just go inside. And of course, if you know anything about me, I had 60 eggs in incubators in my, on my kitchen counter silky chickens and they were supposed to hatch that night and so i was excited to go in there to see you know is there any pipping any cracks in the eggs to see and so i'm in there checking them all oh and i'm talking to them i'm like oh not not today i'll see you guys tomorrow you know like now probably sounds crazy but i go into the bedroom and i go to take off the earring i was wearing and i set it on the net nightstand right next to my bed it's okay Then I had the scariest feeling you can 
ever have as a person or that I think that I will ever have, my head all of a sudden with no warning felt like it was physically doing this. Like swelling up and back down. Swell, and, and the pain that came with that. Um, I knew right away that my life was in danger. It's not like, man, I wonder what that is. It's not that. It's definitely like something is seriously wrong. And so I happened to have my phone right there too. And I call him and I said, hey, come inside. He's like, oh, are the, the chickens hatching? And I'm like, come inside. And so he comes inside and I like, you need to call an ambulance. And he's like, do you have a headache? Do you want me to get you some Advil? And I'm like, I'm about to die. And he's like, what? And so he's still like not getting it because I look okay. Like there's nothing, you don't look at me and think that anything's wrong. Um, and so we finally called the ambulance. We live, you know, kind of in the sticks. So it took them about 15 or 20 minutes to get to us. Um, they were kind of assess assessing the situation and decided to load me up. Um, the last thing that I remember is getting loaded up into the ambulance. And um, Tim can take over the story. Yeah, let me put this in perspective. I've watched my wife being thrown from a horse and break her back and lay calmly on the ground and tell me, don't move me. Call the ambulance and let, get me to the ER. I've watched her carry her toenail in off the pasture after getting stepped on by a horse, laying down on the floor, basically bleeding out her toe and just saying, hey, you think you can put this back on? I've watched her butterfly her own forehead after getting, I don't even know if you got kicked or something, but... No, I was just opening a fence, yeah. and it was stuck, and then it unstuck and hit me. So she's tough. So when she says, I'm about to die, call 911, I knew, I knew it was an emergency. And uh, White Wright Emergency Services took us to Texoma Medical Center. Um, we got there, and they spent about 30 minutes giving Shelly... Uh, migraine. migraine medication. That's what they thought that it was, and... Uh, after about 30 minutes, they said, ah, this isn't working. We're going to go take a CAT scan and an MRI, and we'll be back in a little bit. And about 20 minutes later, they're rolling her back in, and she's still sort of like curled in a fetal position on the, on the bed and holding her head and rocking back and forth and moaning. And the doctor looks at me and, I mean, honestly, very calmly says, so this is the worst um, aneurysm or hemorrhage that I've ever seen. Uh, probably had a slow bleed for a while in the back of her head and uh, in something ruptured. I, it looks like her carotid artery exploded, but honestly, there's so much blood, I can't really tell. Um, but I can tell you this, that we're not going to be able to save her tonight. And I, um, and he said this in the room while, while I'm standing there next next to the bed. And so I asked him to step outside, and I said, I'm going to need you to tell that to me again. And we rolled through that same narrative again. But I noticed that he said something that was important. He said, we're not going to be able to save her here tonight. And I latched onto that word here, and I said, what does that mean? He said, well, honestly, you're very lucky she's even made it into the hospital. But if we can get her down to someplace in Dallas that's, that maybe has um, a specialist or maybe is a little better equipped, there's something that we can do. But all that I can offer here is that we can cut the top of her skull off so that she can pass in, in peace and uh, relatively pain-free. I said, we're not going to do that. Take us to wherever we need to go. They loaded us up onto the helicopter out on the tarmac. They were going to take us to Parkland Hospital in Dallas. We sat on the tarmac for 45 minutes, but because of the thunderstorms, they could not take off. They had to bring us back into the, uh, the ER at Texoma, and they finally decided or discovered that there was a bed available at Medical City Plano, uh, on the fourth floor, which is a neuro ICU. And the only reason that bed became available was because somebody passed during that time that we were waiting on the tarmac. So they took us in an ambulance um, to Plano. And I wanted to read the text because this is important. As we were sitting in Texoma and I was waiting for that, for them to come get her, it was 4.23 a.m. at this point on Wednesday morning. The doctors told me to call and say, hey, you need to get her family here. I've, I've tried to call and text everybody, but like people who live on the West Coast, it's 2 a.m. It's just there's a lot going on. And I open up my phone, and it, you know how like when you open up Facebook Messenger, there's little green dots next to people who are, who are awake, active. active. And the name at the top of the list was Jason Norton. 
So I texted this to Jason. Brother, I need a prayer. Shelly had a brain hemorrhage, and it's not looking good. We are at Texoma Medical waiting for air transport to any hospital in Dallas that can do a surgery immediately. It's life-threatening. I don't want to blast it publicly or anything. I need to notify all of her family first, but I need help. And he responded immediately and said, praying right now, brother. I'm currently in West Texas, where I'd be right there with you. That's when the prayers started. And I called on Jason because, not just because he, he's my pastor and not just because he's my friend, but because I know that man is a prayer warrior. And when I go to battle, I want the strongest, most fierce, most loyal warriors shoulder to shoulder with me. And I knew Jason was that man. So Jason, thank you. Thank you for that. So we ended up in Medical City Plano, and I got pretty much the same response from the doctors there. We probably are not going to be able to save your wife. In fact, it, uh, it's amazing that she survived this long. Uh, we we're going to try to put what they called an EVD or a um, external ventricular drain into her head. Um, it's basically a long spike to help get all the blood and everything out and relieve the pressure that's going on there. And uh, they took her up for surgery, and as I was standing outside the room, and they had curtains drawn over the window, so I could see all these feet, like five pairs of feet just around this bed that Shelly was in. And I felt somebody come up and put their arm around me, and it was Molly Norton. Man. And she prayed with me, and then she went over and she put her hands on the windows, and she was praying over those doctors and that medication and everything else. And man, I'm just telling you, there's nothing more comforting than to know that there's somebody there advocating for you and, and asking for God's work to begin. It was humbling. And uh, if we can go to that first slide. This is what my wife looked like. This was not even eight hours after that her head exploded, basically. And um, it's hard to look back at. She's ventilated. She has max doses of just about every medication that you can imagine. Uh, there's a vent in her head. She has an opening that's allowing the blood to basically come out of her brain uh, and all her spinal fluid and everything else. And I'm just going to give you some quick stats. 99% of the people that have this type of injury don't make it to the hospital. Of the 1% that make it, 99% die on the operating table. And of the 1% that survived that, well, we don't know of any except for the woman sitting next to me that are able to walk, talk, and actually carry on. Uh, some, well, not some of you. A lot of you that were here saw the Facebook post start because after we got to that point, I, was, I knew that we were in trouble and that we needed help. And so I just, I just threw it out there. Um, there were a lot of people that, was one, that were wondering what was going on, and I was just try, doing my best to try to keep everybody informed. In fact, it got to the point where if I didn't do an update on a timely basis, I started getting hate messages from people. It wasn't hate mail. <laughs> they were just like, uh, are you going to update us or what? Because yeah. they feared the worst because it should have been bad. It should have. If you can go to the next slide. Um, this one is... For one, I have one reason there. Before they put that EVD in her head, they asked me if they could shave her head. And let me tell you, I was still in a point of denial because I was thinking like, hey, we've got a show coming up on Friday. <laughs> and I, I don't know that she's going to be real happy with a bald head. So is there any way you can just shave a little part of it? And they, they looked at me like I was nuts, but then went ahead. So and... you can see up, up through this hole, there was a, it was shaved about here. I'm not a bangs person, but these go all the way back. They, they shave just right there. Uh, <laughs> but I, I have this picture there for another reason, too. People, we, we learned things as, as um, time went on, and, and it wasn't actually very long ago. Shelly got a message from a woman who, who reached out and said, hey, I want to tell you something. My 
daughter-in-law was the nurse at Plano, Medical City Plano in the ICU when they took you in that night. And she came home that morning, and it was her. La- she was one of these traveling nurses. It was her last night at Medical City Plano, and she came home distraught. And she told her, and her mom said, "What's or her her mother-in-law said, what's wrong?" She said, "I have to tell you, this woman came in tonight, and she was the most beautiful woman that I've ever seen. And she has the worst aneurysm that we've ever seen ever." And she's not going to make it. And I just think about looking at that woman's face and looking at her husband that was there and the family that was starting to show up. And, and I just don't even know how I can go on with myself knowing that she, that woman's not going to make it. And that, that's, the, that's the face that she saw. And her mother-in-law told her, said, hey, several weeks down the road, hey, remember that woman you told me about? Yeah, and she showed her a picture from Facebook. Is this her? She goes, yeah, that's her. She goes, she made it. And she was blown away. You, you know more about that than I do because she was the one messaging you. No, she was just extremely shocked. Um, and they made the connection that it was me. She obviously didn't know who I was when we came into the hospital, but just happened to tell her mother-in-law about the woman that she saw. Expect, I mean, the people especially that live or that work on that floor in that hospital see a lot of death. God bless them for doing that because it's got to be so hard. Um, but she just broke down in front of her mother-in-law and said, man, it's, it was just hard today when they saw that. And um, she couldn't believe it that it was me. And then I was not only just living, but up walking, talking, and like nothing happened. So, so if we can go to the next slide. I want to tell you quickly about one of our very close friends, Rebecca Sprouse. A lot of you know Rebecca. Rebecca's the reason why we came to this church. She told us about this church a couple years ago and um, invited us to come to a service. And other than uh, Shelly deciding to take a couple months off for uh, brain aneurysm, we really haven't missed In fact, w- the first Sunday we came, I'll remember, I remember this, we walked up to the front and Pastor Jason was sitting outside, and his first words to us was like, I wonder what, I was wondering when you were going to come. He said that to Shelly. But we, we knew that we were amongst our people, uh, especially after Rebecca told us about this church. So Rebecca had been instrumental in not only in getting us here, but within minutes of her finding out what was going on with Shelly, she, she was like a worker bee. She, was organized, she organized an online prayer uh, chain I mean, there's thousands of people on that, and she still updates it daily. I, I comes across my feed, and I'm like, man, Becca. Relentless. Yeah. Relentless. Relentless prayer warrior. She was also relentless about talking to me. I want to come up there. I want to come up there. I want to come see Shelly. And let me tell you, we were in a neuro ICU, and Shelly's brain was exposed to the air. You just didn't walk in and out of that place. We broke a lot of rules, but they were telling me, you're not going to let, you're not going to have visitors. You're not going to have visitors. And Rebecca was like, I'm not going to have any of that. And I have something that I want to bring to you. And it's in that picture. You can see it laying over Shelly's feet there. But I'm going to let Becca, I want you to tell a little bit about this. So this is a prayer shawl that my mom had given me. And it came straight from Israel. And there's some power in this. I mean, there is some power. Um, It's been prayed over by so many people. It's been anointed. It's been on people who have been bad off, um, weren't given good prognosis. They're supposed to be deceased. And my mom got it to me. You can do these how you want. Uh, The Jewish custom, they have it done a certain way. But this particular one, each knot represents a prayer, and then they start representing answered prayers. And if you notice, there's several. This has been a testimony to a lot of people. Um, But anyways, my mom gave it to me, and she said that you got to have Jason anoint it and pray over it. And I went back, and I looked for the text. Luckily, I don't delete too much, so... If you text me, I got some evidence on you. (laughs) But anyways, I went back and looked where I was 
talking to Jason and I said, my mom really needs me to get this to you. It was you specific. And me and him stood in the driveway and we prayed over it and he anointed it. And I just had to get it to her. This too was laid over the faces of many. It has a lot of prayers on it, a lot of scriptures. And every one of them was read over her, over many other people, not just the day that it got put on her, but several times. Um, they were very respectful of it. I thought maybe they might be kind of weird about it. But he was. every time I went, it was always there. They made sure that they didn't mess with it, that they put it back on her right where it was at every time. But um, there's, I mean, I'm after touching it, it's just got so much power in it. And I got to read a couple of things. So uh, I was looking it up because I had a feeling this day would come. <laughs> um, this shawl, it says, may this shawl made with love through prayer be a mantle and a sign of God's healing presence. And then also another prayer for it is to give someone a tangible example of God's love and care. And the sum that might just be cloth, but it's, it's scriptural also about the shawl. And you can look it up. Uh, it's in Numbers. It's in Deuteronomy. It's in several places. And uh, so it's very powerful. It's not just something that an old Native American said, hey, slap this on her. I mean, it, it actually has purpose. But also when I was looking, um, it was August 6th. When I was getting with you saying, hey, I got to get this to her. I got to get this to her. Um, I found a prayer that I asked him to read to you because that day you were about to go back to surgery. Hopefully y'all can understand. So anyways, I said, hey, Tim, please read this to Shelly. Shelly, I wanted to say something before you're wheeled back. I know when you wake up, you're going to have awesome stories to tell about the journey you're on spiritually. The Holy Spirit was telling me last night and again when I screen recorded your song a while ago because she sang a song. It's her favorite one. Of course, it's got to be a hard one, but I sang it at a uh, vigil that we did for her. But anyways, um, when I screen recorded your song a while ago, he's taking you to greater heights. He is going to use you for unimaginable works. The elections you ran in, will be small compared to what's to come. You're still united people in such a powerful way. What better way to unite than to be in unison flooding heaven with prayers? I still said more, so let me take a break right there. What I mean by that is if you're lucky enough to be in that room, just imagine some of these silly movies you see and like, I don't know, bullies or whatever. There's like text messages all around them in the room, like, you're whatever, you're whatever. Well, anyways, imagine that in that room. It's every prayer that everybody prayed. You could feel it so thick. It is indescribable what that room felt like. It's like you could just look and see a bubble every time someone said a prayer. We prayed 24-7. We prayed in shifts. People were waking up at 3 in the morning saying, hey, I got this. Tell me that. You go to sleep. We were praying around the clock for her. We were very specific in our prayers. Um, and not just minimal prayers, but bold, mighty prayers. I was kind of, she's real close to me, so I was kind of get a little irritated at some of the things I was seeing. And it was, Lord, whatever your will is. And that really was bothering me. Because to me, and I'm not minimizing nobody, so don't take what I say wrong. It's how I felt. To me, that's the, the give up prayer. The you take her, you take her. But I was like, no, I'm fighting for her. I'm going to fight for her like I've never fought for anyone else before. And other people felt the same way. What can I do? What can I pray? And that's when we start getting specific. And I'm sure he's going to get to that part, so I won't take it from him. But anyways, I value our friendship. I'm so proud to call you my friend, your family as well. I think it's beyond friendship at this point, but an adopted family. God has you, and I'm a bit jelly, sister. I love you so much. Can't wait to hug your neck again. I may not let go. God made it urgent for me to see you that Sunday before. And do you remember what happened that Sunday? Um, Victor spilled his drink. 
And if you know anything about them during that time, they were out of here. As soon as service was over, you don't see them. They're like a Looney Tunes character. Boom, <laughs> out the door, you don't see them. Well, Victor, their boy, he was so embarrassed. He spilt his drink, and they gave me and her time to chat. So I got to tell Victor, thank you for that. I now know why it was urgent. I'll see you soon, sister. I hope you heard the songs I sang to you last night. And by the way, your favorite song is hard. But thank goodness I was able to practice it and not wing it. Love you, and I'm praying. <laughs> thank you so much. So we, um, we have, wait, come back. We have decided to, to give this back to you, even though it, it means a lot to us, but she's obviously the, the steward of it. Like, you are the one that knows exactly what to do. To, and, and unfortunately, someone will need this. And I know you'll know exactly who will need. So please take a part of our heart back with you. Take, obviously, take care of this and, and use this because you know exactly when someone needs this. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. And let me tell you, <clears throat> as we progressed through those three weeks in the ICU, and especially once uh, they realized that Shelly was healing, and I told them when they would take her away for surgeries, I would, they would be taking like the sheets off and stuff, and I'd say that if that can't stay over her, at least that needs to stay on the bed. Like it never left the bed, uh, except for a couple of times when they were changing her linens. But... Um, nurses and doctors and people would start wandering into our ICU room at two or three in the morning and they would be playing with that shawl. They'd come in and be rubbing the knots between their fingers and touching it and stuff. And I was wondering what was going on. And so one night I followed a nurse out. She came in, she touched the shawl for about 30 seconds. She thought I was sleeping on the couch. She went out, I got up really quick and followed her and she goes out, goes down, goes in the next room, walks into the room and puts her hand flat on her patient and starts praying. That's powerful. And I'm going to tell you why that's powerful, because there are, a lot of, there are a lot of believers in the medical field, and then there's a lot that really believe in the science. And to watch, I'm going to call it, I don't really know what else to call it, but to watch a revival start on that ICU floor where people were coming into our room to gather prayer strength because you could feel it, and then go take that to other patients on the floor. It was amazing to watch that happening. Yeah. There was another thing that happened. I'm going to tell a little bit about this story, and then I'm going to ask him to come up and share for just a second. Um, it wasn't too long. It was right around the same time that Rebecca brought up the prayer shawl, maybe a day or two later. But um, Colby reached out to me um, asking if the, uh, his prayer ministry, his team, could come up and pray. And I, w I was in a medically induced coma still. Oh, yeah. This is early. Yeah, this so, is early. Yeah. And I, I told him, I said, you're welcome to come. I can't promise that they're going to let you in the room I, because they're just really stingy about what's going on. But if you want to come, in fact, he, they, were, I, they were on their way, and they actually took Shelly for an emergency surgery. And I messaged him, and I said, hey, they just took her for another surgery. Maybe you want to turn around. He's like, nope, we're already on the way. We're coming. I didn't really know what that meant until I watched elevator load after elevator load after elevator load after elevator load of men, women, children, families come up and fill that waiting room. And let me tell you, we already had, between Shelly's family, my family, and some close friends, we already had a, a good, any time you went there, there was at least a dozen, maybe up to 20 people there waiting, just hanging out. So when another, I don't know, maybe 30 or so showed up, yeah, we, we filled that room. And they came up, and we all, we talked for a few minutes, and then we all circled up to pray. And I want to tell you about a couple miracles that happened at that point. One, Shelly's mom and dad do not spend very much time in the same room, ever. And they were there in that waiting room, together and it was a little, you know, a little tense. But when they circled us up to pray, I noticed this. <laughs> Shelly's dad and Shelly's mom were right next to one another. And he had his arm around her and they were they were praying. 
Hallelujah for that. Also, are you going to talk about the oil? I am talking to talk about the oil. Some of us are used to being anointed. Some of us have seen it. Some of us don't know anything about it. And some of Shelly's family, her, her dad and mom specifically, never seen anything like that before. Well, they, they had the oil out, and it, I was watching, and it was like <laughs> when they anointed her mom, her mom accusingly looked at her dad, <laughs> wondering if he was like giving her a little like a wet willy in the ear or something like that. It wasn't. But also what was amazing, so we're all circled up. There's a good 40 or 50 of us now praying in that room. And there's, there's other people around, although it was, it was late in the evening. But you knew something special was happening because we, we finished that. And, I, and Colby asked, he said, do you think we can go see her? And I said, let's, let's just go. We're just going to walk down there and see what happens. And we walked down there. We were unopposed. Not one nurse said a word. Not one doctor said a word. All the doors that were normally locked were open. And we walked into the room, and Colby respectfully asked me, he said, can I lay hands on your wife and pray? And I said, you absolutely can. Okay, so uh, I had a motorcycle shop. It's over one night, really late, and I was getting all the news about Shelly. And, uh, man, I just started praying. I was by myself, and I just entered beside this bike, and I was just working, and I just started praying. And... uh, I messaged Tim the next morning. It's about, I think it's like 5 o'clock in the morning. And uh, just let him know, hey, brothers, you need anything? Reach out. I'm right here. And I get the typical, hey, man, we're doing right now, but I'll let you know. Okay. And she was still heavy on my heart. And he was heavy on my heart. And uh, so I reached out again. Hey, brother. Can we just come up there? You know, can we? Well, not right now, not right now. Well, whenever you in the ministry like this, you get that all the time. And then there comes a time when the Lord says, go. And it don't matter what man, woman, doctor, it don't matter what they say. You listen to dad and you go. So uh, on the 6th is whenever he was having the surgery. And so he said, hey, the big surgery's today. So we started praying. I prayed. I remember Every time I even thought about it, I just prayed. And uh, so I told him, I said, hey, man, can we come up? And he said, no, you know, you just wait. They're not going to let anybody in. The doors are all shut. They're, I don't know if you're sure they're going to let me in and everything. So uh, I was like, okay. And then just I felt the Lord say go on the 8th. And uh, so I said, hey, brother, give me a call. Because I asked him, hey, can we come up? And he's like, no, you know, they got the door shut. And I was like, hey, brother, give me a call. And I remember specifically the phone call was to let him know the Lord is sending people in his place to use in this time of ministering. You've got to quit listening to what men have to say. Sometimes our biggest fight for the people we love is standing up on our feet and saying, come on. So if you ever get in a position where you feel like they're not going to be able to make it, but you know it needs to happen, let it happen. Because you, you, you never know what the Lord's, who he's sending, what he's doing. But just let it happen and trust in the Lord the whole way. So uh, the emotions when we walked in the waiting room, all of us, kind of over here we had that passive feeling. People was just passive. Uh, you know, everything's going to be okay, you know. But body language speaks something t- completely different. Then over here, you've got anger and the ones that just don't understand. And in the whole room, everybody's battling something. So I'm just sitting there and I'm just, Lord, you know, what do we do? What do we do? We're here now. What do we do? And the Lord said, pray for everybody, grab Tim, and go back there. And like I said, we circled up, we prayed, we did the oil, and I did notice the dad, <laughs> he was, <laughs> he's like, oh, 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 okay. So, uh, <laughs> it was, it was amazing. Uh, we got done praying and I grabbed Tim, I said, let's go. He goes, well, if they'll let us back there, I said, I don't care, let's go. 
And we made that left. I remember making the left out of the waiting room, and there's a set of doors there that's naturally closed, and they was wide open. And I was like, Lord, you just make sure all the doors are open. We got back to the back, and I think there was a second set of glass doors, and they was wide open. And then we got back out to our room. He says, well, our room's probably shut. We'll have to have somebody let us in. Door was wide open. And I said, thank you, Lord. And I remember going back there. And as, as soon as I got to her bedside, the Lord said, I'm not done with her yet. And you're going to have to pray and speak that life that her husband knows how to battle and help him on how to battle for his wife. And not only but battle for her because she wasn't dead. She wasn't dead. There were still things going on in her mind. But you pray life and speak life. So we done that, and Tim, he looked at me, he goes, you're a prayer warrior. I'm like, I guess. <laughs> he says, truly. So we went back. So whenever we went back to the waiting room, that whole feeling that was in there before had changed. And uh, I think it was her mom coming to me and says, well, what do you think? I said, I think God's completely in control, and he says she's going to live and she's going to live. And uh, I can remember just looking at me and going, thank you. I'm my like, man, you got to thank Jesus. This ain't me. This is all Jesus. So that was my experience. Thank you, yes, sir. I want to tell you, when Colby laid hands on Shelly, there, there was, I actually... At the very beginning, for those first few days, they did not like it. The doctors not like it when I came into Shelly's room because her heart rate would increase and her blood pressure would go up every time I walked in the room. Good or bad? I uh, don't know. <laughs> but that night when we went in, and, Col and I, I was sort of joking with Colby. I said, yeah, she's going to hear my voice and watch. Her, her numbers are going to fluctuate. And they did a little bit, but... Something happened. Her numbers had been way out of whack, of course. But when he laid his hands on her and started praying, I watched every number on that machine, every line, every graph go to normal. Like, happen. Like that. And it wasn't like even like, oh, I'm sort of imagining, is that moving? It was like everything just normalized. And there was a different look on her face. And I remember Colby telling me, he said, hey, I can... I can feel everything. Tim, everything's going to be all right. I can, I can feel her in there. I can feel her presence in there right now. It's all going to be good. If we go to the next, next slide. So we finally have, we had seven surgeries in six days. I'm going to try to sort of get, get through this now, wrap up. Um, had seven surgeries in six days. We had, uh, Shelly had, they, they think, eight strokes um, while we were there. The first surgery, the first major surgery to repair the carotid failed. Um, in fact, they told me after that night, they said that she wasn't going to make it. Uh, if she did, that they would um, try something else, but that they were just fearful they were not going to be able to repair the carotid. Um, and I have to apologize to a lot of you because I never was 100% honest on Facebook at how dire the situation was. And I, probably some of you go back and read those posts and go, wow, well, I mean, that seemed pretty, pretty bad or pretty grim. But... I was afraid that if I told everybody how bad it really was, that the prayers were going to be for her peaceful passing and for comfort of the family, and I was not ready to give up. So I just kept trying to be as positive as I could. So we finally have a surgery that works. I'm going to show you a couple things. One, you heard us talk about this EVD that's in her head. That's this spike right here, by the way, that's coming down. It's like the size of a pencil that goes down and in the middle of her head, a metal spike. I didn't realize that till I watched them pull it out of her head. I just thought a drain was going to be like a, a, a hose coming out of her head. But what's more important down here, this thick area, um, it's what's called a flex embolization device. Um, there's not very many of these out there. Um, in fact, it's only been on the market for a few years. It was recalled for the first two years it was on the market because it was killing the patients that they were putting it in. 
Um, it's the only way that they've found to be able to fix the hemorrhage carotid artery. Um, that's what you see down here. But what's more important on this picture, you see blood activity on the right side of her brain, and you see no activity on the left side of her brain. And after the doctor, the surgeon fixed her carotid, they took me down to the waiting room, and um, she was showing me, and she was excited. She said, I think I fixed a carotid artery. Um, I, think, I think that your wife has a good chance of making it, which is the first time I'd heard something like that. But she also said, I have to warn you, there's going to be some severe deficiencies. Or the left side of her brain's dead which would control all the motor function on the right side of her body. It would also control her language, her ability to speak, and her logistical thoughts. So your wife will not be able to, she'll be paralyzed and probably not be able to speak, talk, um, or really carry on a conversation with you. I hope you're prepared for that. I said, okay. I mean, I've been just been praying to, that she was going to live, so we've, we've already, we've gotten that far. Uh, so we go back, uh, they, and we start a process of every day they're trying to uh, relieve the strokes that are continuing to uh, um, plague, plague her head. And, uh, yeah, well, we're not quite there yet. But <laughs> um, we are on this road of not really sure where we're going. We need, we, but we do need Shelly to wake up. And so you might remember seeing me start praying for her. Hey, I need Shelly to wake up. need her to wake up. The reason why the doctors came in after uh, seven days and basically said they shut off all the medication, they shut off the ventilator, everything, and said we need to see if that she actually is still alive because if she was in a medically induced coma and the machines were keeping her alive. And they shut it off so said, hey, we're going to wait 30 minutes and see what happens. We'll be back. And then walked out of the room. I was stuck in, when I say stuck in the room, because again, we're in an ICU, and you, unless you're Colby, you can't just walk in and out. And, um, but uh, I was in the room with Shelly's sister, Carrie, and I was really mad. I was really frustrated, and we were watching, 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 and finally I just hit my knees on the floor next to the bed. And I got really angry with God, and I said, God, like, I'm done with this. I need my wife back. I don't, we've been so obedient to everything that you've asked us to do for the last several years. And we've been on this journey and I don't understand why we're here now. I just know this, like I need my wife back. I don't care about deficiencies. I don't care about medical bills. I don't care about anything else. Wake my wife up, give her back to me now. And then we're going to, we'll deal with it one step at a time after that. Probably a dangerous prayer, honestly, because I was pretty angry and I stood up, we can go to the next slide. I, I stood up and um, leaned over to kiss Oh, I'm sorry, we'll go one more slide. Um, I leaned over to kiss Shelly's forehead, and as I stood back up, her eyes opened up, fluttered open. Her sister, Carrie, had been taking pictures and videoing, just hoping to try to get some sort of movement to show the doctor, and she caught that moment. And I looked at Shelly, and her eyes were a little unfocused, and I knew, you know, I didn't really know what to expect, but I just looked at her, and I said, hey, like, I love you. And she mouthed some words around the ventilator. And it was either I love you or what are you doing? <laughs> I'm going to think it's probably what are you doing, uh, looking back on it. But, of course, I'm immediately like, hey, she's awake. Let's go. It's go time. And uh, so now we're on, a, we're on a new path, a new path of recovery. But she's still not really talking. She's not moving. And she hasn't eaten. It's, now we're on a day 10 in the ICU. And they come with a feeding tube. They want to get some nutrients uh, into her. And the doctor comes in with the nurses and they're putting the feeding tube in her left nostril. Remember, um, I'm sorry, her right nostril. Remember her left side of her brain is, is damaged. And the nurses asked, do we need to restrain her? The doctor said, nope, she's paralyzed. Just get that feeding tube in. And apparently when you're sticking a feeding tube in, there comes a point, what they call the point of resistance, where that tube has to turn around and start heading back down in the stomach. And apparently it's very uncomfortable. I wouldn't know, haven't had one in. Or, or, uh, but they, I saw the nurse hit that point of resistance, push really hard to get it through, and I watched my wife's hand shoot up, gr grab him around the neck, <laughs> choke him with enough strength, choke him with enough strength that his knees begin to buckle, 
And she says, stop doing that. You're hurting me. And I am like, hey, she can move and she can talk. What's crazy is that doctors were in it and on it like a second. And they're like, hey, we're going for a CAT scan. We need to figure out what's going on. They go back. They come back. They had that same scan with the left side of her brain dead, right side working. And the doctor, and I make, I, I make fun. I, point, I, I poke fun at these doctors, but we're old. These doctors are all young, and they all look like they're 12 years old and about this tall. <laughs> and I call them, if you remember Doogie Hauser, I call them Doogie 1 and Doogie 2. And Doogie 2 is jumping around, and he is so excited. And he goes, I can't explain it, I can't explain it, I can't explain it. And I'm like, what can't you explain? And he takes uh, Shelly's sister carrying me over to the computer screen, and he pulls up a picture of her brain, and he goes, the left side of her brain is dead, but she is talking and she's moving. I can't explain it. And I said, I can. Mm -hmm. And then we had to start praying for Shelly to go back to sleep because we prayed so hard that for three days she would not go back to sleep. And it, and it became, uh, Jason came to visit a couple times. Um, they watched HGTV together, which Shelly's never watched in her entire life. I, I don't know, if Jason, if you've ever watched HGTV or not. But um, Shelly's having conversations with people and, and talking, and we just... And she I'm like, Jason, do you think they're going to love it or lease it? You know, like just, <laughs> I, I never watched that show. Yeah. Um, so anyway, we're, we're, I'm starting to see a light at the end of the tunnel. And um, if we go to the next slide, please. Um, you're going to see this is uh, Shelly's sister, Carrie, that after she had her feeding tube finally installed correctly and she wasn't choking any of the nurses out. Um, but Shelly was, conf we didn't. I thought she knew everything that was going on. She had no clue what was going on. I don't remember any of it. I don't remember being in the hospital. I remember getting in the ambulance and then um, honestly don't remember until like after being home two or three weeks, I remember Jason and Molly coming over to visit, but I don't remember anything in between still. It's probably a gift from God. But she... It came, she was on a mission to get out of that hospital. And now remember, she still has a vent in her brain with an open skull, or op op a skull open to her brain. Has about 14 tubes, arterial lines, a central catheter, all sorts of stuff going on. And she would, and they finally, when they took the ventilator out, they would, she would talk and she had a raspy voice and they'd be, leave the room for a minute and she'd be like, hey babe, go get the stuff and let's get out of here. I'm like, we're not going anywhere. Like, we're, we're still, we're stuck here. But it became, it became a mission of hers to, to get out. And um, so that's what we started praying for every day. D direct prayer. Hey, whatever the, whatever the uh, issue was that needed to be fixed, that's what we prayed for that day. We prayed for another line to be taken out. We prayed for uh, the EVD to be removed. We prayed for her numbers to get better. Um, and we finally reached a, a time when the doctors came to us and said, hey, we're going to send you home. And it was after, um, it was just over three weeks that we've been in the ICU that we got sent home. Everybody thinks, well, okay, so that's good. So the, the story's over. But um, not really because we got home and what we didn't realize was that, like, not only did Shelly not remember anything, but um, we had to fight through weaning off of medication. There, were, there was a lot of fear and anxiety in her life. Um, I don't know if you wanted. Yeah, I was taking handfuls of medication on a on a schedule. Like just, I was probably awake just a few hours of the day. I slept a lot. My brain was trying to heal. Um, and then one day I asked I asked you a question because I was just really confused. Still. Yeah, she she looked at me and she said, "Hey, so I had two aneurysms, right?" And I'm like, "No, what are you talking about?" She said, "Well, we went to the hospital." Like, they said I had an aneurysm. We came home, and, like, everything was really good for a week. Like, we were, like, sitting on the porch, and the animals were hanging out, and, like, my family was here, and, like, everything was good. And then I had another aneurysm, and then we went to Plano. Like, no, that's not what happened. And uh, we got to talking about it, and then Shelly would wake me up in the middle of the night, and she'd say, like, hey, how do I know I'm not dreaming? And I'm like, what are you talking about? She'd say, well, am I, am I really home? I said, yeah, you're home. Well, how do I know that this isn't a dream like that other dream that I had thinking that I had two aneurysms? I'm like, well, do you remember that you had a brain aneurysm? Yeah. 
well, then that's how you know that this isn't a dream. Like, remember the, the hard stuff that we went through. But it took a long time to get over that. And because it felt real, it, it was real. And now looking back on it, it must have been when I was in my coma, co- coma, mm-hmm. that sounds weird, um, that I think God put me in a peaceful place, I think, um, where I was happy, everything was good. Um, but we were still, we, we were fighting with some fear and some anxiety and some things, and I had to get back to work, and it was several months later, and every time I played a show, I always would stop in the middle of the show and talk about my wife, and I would testify about the miracle that God had saved her life, every time. Um, in fact, I started taking some some hits on it. People started, like, sort of getting after me on social media, like, why are you preaching at your concerts? Like, we, we came to see Billy Joel. We didn't come to see you preach. Um, and as a performer, I knew that I was possibly killing my own career as a performer. As a Christian, I didn't care one bit. And something interesting, you know, something interesting happened. I was doing a show in Grapevine at a little bar called Tolbert's. And I talk about Shelly. A lot of people like it. Some people don't. I don't really care. But a guy comes up to me at the end of the show and he says, hey, I'm a nurse at UT Southwestern. I work for this amazing uh, neuro uh, specialist, neurosurgeon. I think there's some things that we could do for your wife if you'd bring her in. I'm like, all right, whatever. I mean, in my mind, I'm like, this guy doesn't know that we've seen every doctor and everything. But I told Shelly about it just because it was something interesting. And she was like, oh, yeah, well, maybe, you know, I don't know. And the guy called, he got my number, and he was calling me all the time. Like, hey, I really want to get you in. I really want to get you in. And I was using the excuse, like, man, I don't know if the, our insurance is going to cover that or whatever, blah, blah, blah. Well, he figured out our, he, he found our information, figured out the insurance would cover it. Like, finally, Shelly said, hey, I, I think I want to go see that doctor. Like, I, let, what, what's it going to hurt? And we went to that doctor at UT Southwestern, and they checked her out on, on everything, and the doctors came and talked to us for a while and said, Shelly, you know, honestly, you're healed. What's bothering you? What are you, what are you having anxiety about? What's, what's worrying you? And Shelly said, well, honestly, I'm, how do I know this isn't going to happen again? And the doctor spent some time talking to us about the fact that, well, look, first thing, your surgeon is going to be in your head every six months looking at this thing. You have more scan, scans of your brain than anybody else on the planet most likely we're going to catch anything that's going to happen long before it all ever happened. There's a better chance of an aneurysm happening to your husband than there is to you. So you know what? It's time for you to go start living your life. And how did that, honestly, how did that make you feel, that doctor? I mean, we hadn't left the house very much before that, but that just gave me that, not that al- alone, but just the, the, that along with the peace that God gave me that it's everything was going to be okay. I just, from that point forward, trusted that God's got this. And it was like a light switch that went on in my brain. And, and all of a sudden, I was, had no fear at all. And so I even came to the conclusion that if it was my time to go at any time, I was okay with that. Um, it was, it was very, a really peaceful, which scares him, but it's a very peaceful feeling for him, for me. Mm-hmm. So... You know, here here we are on the other side of something. And if we can go to the, I think it's the last slide. Um, and there's a reason why I want to show this slide. I started with a, one really simple text message to our pastor. And then I put out a, a thing on Facebook. I don't really know how many people saw the first fake Facebook post. A couple hundred. It doesn't really matter. But what matters is every single one of you started praying People like Rebecca, starting that prayer chain. People like Colby, bringing people. There's no way we could ever thank all of you for the amount of prayer that you poured into us. And the spiritual, I'm just going to, I can't even explain it. The, The visual I have is this like, this beam of prayer and spiritual power that was just coming, shooting up out of this church and out of you people, and coming down, and 
not only landing in this room, this hospital room, but it was like splashing all over everybody else that was around us. And when I posted that, it was actually a, a little video of Shelly walking. And then I think, Becca, I think you were the one who made a little meme, meme about this, but it only took a week. 3.2 million people watched Shelly take her first steps after she got up out of the bed. It, it's, it's like overwhelming to me and crazy, but it reaffirms something. God was building us a platform for something and he gave us a miracle that we need to be, be obedient to and continue to share and tell you about. So that's... So what I want to say... Oh, yeah. Um, what, what I want to say is... Thank you. It's... It's not enough. It will never be en enough. You are... I have so much love for all of you, and you will never know how much I respect you and honor that you took time out of your lives that are busy to stop and, and pray for me and my husband. I, I don't even, thank you will never be enough, but I wanted to say thank you so much. Thank you. So the final thought in all this, because this is where we started. On Sunday, April 2nd, Shelly prayed, God, I know you can take away my headaches. On April 4th, she suffered the worst aneurysm that any doctor has ever seen. And honestly, not many, if ever, have any survived that. But have you had a headache since that prayer? And I don't take, I take a, a baby aspirin daily. I don't take all of that medicine. Um, the doctor is like, I can't explain it, but your brain looks completely normal when we look at it. I had arteries from this side of my brain go and go and work for the other side of my brain that doesn't that wasn't working, and they just look at me like, that's what they look like, and I'm like, I know, you should meet the people at my church. Um, but I think what I want to tell you is, and what, and what we were telling you. You pray because you know how powerful God is, not hoping that he will do something. You knew, you knew he could save me. And you demanded that he save me. And that is what I owe my life to and him. And it, all the glory goes to him, but to you too. And this is not a political thing. But we always thought the whole salon incident was like this big deal. And we got put on TV and we ran all these campaigns to try to meet as many people as we could. But now we know why God did that for us. Because now we can tell every person that we meet. And, and if you go to anywhere where I speak now politically, I say, I don't care about the politics. It's not about the politics. I have to tell you how God saved me and what a miracle he is. So I want to thank you for your time tonight. I'm going to close this in prayer, but before I do, um, I do want to tell you, so we have some books out in the back, and this is, I, I, I started writing the book, I actually, I took a journal, and I, I, besides writing on Facebook, I was texting my wife when she was in a coma every day, hoping she'd have something to read when she woke up. I also was just journaling, I don't know why, now I know why. God wanted me to write this all down. And I started writing the book. I quit writing the book before it was finished. And then my wife got mad at me one day and said, would you please finish the book? I'm like, why? Nobody, nobody really wants to read it. And she goes, I want to read it because I don't know what happened to me. So I finished the book for her. And it's, it's a mission now for us. We sell the books for 20 bucks. If you have 20 bucks, great. If you don't, 
take, I don't care if you take one anyway, honestly. Like, this is our, it's our gift and our story that we want to share. The money that we get from it, we use to just buy more books. We're trying to constantly increase the inventory and get more of them out there. Um, but if you do take one, please sh read it and share it. So, so it will give people hope again. Yeah, so um, we'd love to sign a book back there for you. Again, like I said, if you have something you'd like to give us for the book, great. If not, it, again, it's, it's a story that we want to share, and we want to continue to tell people about the miracle God did, and not just for us, but the miracle. It talks about a lot of these things that you heard about tonight and a lot of things you didn't hear about tonight, but it does talk about the strength and the power of prayer and especially the power of prayer that came out of this church. And it's important for people to know because I think we need to go out and model that for people out in the community. Because, and Jason preached about it Sunday, the last thing I'm gonna say. People come and, and they, people come to us and they tell us their stories, their own testimony, some of it good, some of it bad. And I've had people walk up to me and say, well, you know, God saved your wife, why didn't he save my spouse? Or why didn't he save my child? Or why didn't he save my, and I don't have an answer for them. But after hearing Jason talk on Sunday, I think part of the answer is when you're praying, you have to have hope, faith, and you have to believe and know that God has the power to do it. And you also have to know that the person that you're praying for wants it. My wife was inside fighting. She was in here fighting to get back out. If, if she wasn't fighting, the, the outcome may have been different. If I wasn't fighting for her, the outcome might have been different. If I just told everybody, hey, I'm giving up. Let's just pray for peace and a, and a good funeral and let's go home. Colby didn't give up. Rebecca didn't give up. Jason didn't give up. Molly didn't give up. None of you gave up. And for that, I'm eternally grateful and thankful. If there's anything that we can ever do for you, we are trying to be the prayer warriors that you all modeled for us. So we want to pray that way for you, and I'm going to pray for that way for you right now. Let's all bow our heads together. God, Thank you so much for this church family. Thank you so much for the miracle that you brought into our lives. Thank you for continuing to provide a miracle for this community as this church is a light. It's a beacon of hope. It's, shine, it's a shining star. Lord, we are here not just to worship you, but to make new disciples and to bring new believers into the fold, Lord, and to save as many people as possible. We know you're coming. We know that the time is close. And Lord, we can think of nothing more than the greatness and the glory of being with you. And we want as many of our brothers and sisters that we can take with us. So Lord, just continue to energize and mobilize everyone here. Lord, bless them tenfold for all the prayer and the blessing that they gave us. And Lord Jesus, I just thank you so much for the gift that you have given my wife and the opportunity you've given me to continue to love her. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you, everybody. We will see you in the back.